open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. One of the one third of the three-headed monster that is the creators of Tyrant's Conquest, which we'll be getting into today. The one and only Nicholas West. Not to be confused with East. <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to be bringing booze to this party, but you know, <laughs> I'm sure we could find something. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure I can I'm sure, I think I've still got some whiskey in the back. There's still whiskey in the jar. But it's the the tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, the origin story, if you will. So <laughs> absolutely. With so that in, with that in mind, I'd like to ask, I'd like you to walk me through how you got into role playing games and what what made it stick. It, I mean, I ever since I was a kid, I've read. Uh, at the core of it, I think everyone who role plays is escapism. You know, I want to be someone I'm not currently. You know, I, I want to go do, I want to go fight dragons. I want to go do the things that are awesome. But, you know, dragons don't exist. And honestly, adventuring's hard. It's hot. You don't eat enough. It's just awful. So it's much easier to go, I went hungry for three days than to actually do it. So I really started uh, at probably 12 or 13 playing D&D second with, you know, around a table with a bunch of other teenagers. And it was awful. Don't get me wrong. I mean, our first session, we got given a griffin as a pet. I mean, <laughs> we were awful. It was very rule of cool style. Um, and since then, over the last 14, 15 years, uh, we've really been able, I've really gotten a lot more serious about it. Um, and spent a lot of the last 10 years Game, being the GM for everything from Dark Heresy to D&D 2, 3.5, and 5. Um, and really kind of wandering around the tabletop role-playing scape. Um, trying to find a game I really just spoke to me. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, when... One of the things I one of the things that I noticed with Tyrant's Conquest is the is the fact that it is using a D100 system. But if I'm not mistaken, from what I'm seeing, you're using a roll high D100, a la Rollmaster. Was that an influence? Um. So, yes and no. GURPS and Rollmaster were po after my time. Um, they were very much spoken of in in high terms, and I've gotten my hands on the books. Um. And again, Rollmaster is a very interesting system. I've never been able to play it, but the charts for it make everything super complicated and slow down active play. Um, and, and from what I've seen, I've never actually played it. Um, so to a degree, yes, we came from the same beginning of we want to make things uh, more customizable, more intuitive, but Beyond that, I, I there, there's not a massive influence. Mm -hmm. It's more of a not D and D influence than it is a role master influence. And I've seen I've seen plenty of plenty of folks who do who have not D and D as one of their pillars. But one thing I'm curious about is was it a what were so, what were some of the what were some of the big things with D, with D and D that um, got that got under your skin where you were like I don't want to do that. So D and D is great as long as you're playing D and D style games. Um, it's the best beginner system in my opinion. It gets people into what a tabletop role playing is. But once you move past the basic slay the princess, you know, slay the dragon, save the princess, kind of the basics, the tropes. Um, you almost need to take another step. You almost need to go play Shadows of the Demon Lord or Pathfinder or, or well, Pathfinder second, maybe not first. Um, but you, you need to branch out because otherwise, even 5th edition, which tried really hard to kind of put a stop to it with allowing multiple subclasses, you kind of end up tropish. Um, it, it's hard to avoid 
playing a trope in D&D. Mm -hmm. And given that's cer that's certainly the case and while I've um I have been very critical to the idea of D&D in general in 5th edition particularly being an introduction to role playing. Um, if only if only because if only because certain people don't work out of certain bad habits if they play too much of just that one game. There is that. As I said I, I consider it a, a great stepping stone, but if you don't step past it, you you know, absolutely end up in bad habits. Especially from the DM side of it, I would say. Well, one there. You've probably seen the narrative that the, that um the game that the game fall the game falls off once you get past tenth level or nobody plays high level. Um, yeah, yeah. I I don't really buy into it, but yeah, I did. I've seen it. I did my own exploration of that, and I see it. I see it more as a failure of support. Um, that and that and trying to use challenge rating as a as a be all end all, which I wasn't a fan of challenge rating back in two thousand. I'm still not. Twenty two <laughs> years later. Because it because challenge rating makes way too many assumptions. Yes, especially um, when you try and set a challenge rating to a party and not an individual, um, which is actually what we did in our core book. We have uh, we do it based off tiers, so you'll have like a metallic tier that's related to the tier of the person you're fighting, and also how to build your own. And instead of having it balanced to the party, we balance it to a single character of that level. Mm -hmm. and, Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, that, I, I know you were going good on challenge rating. I just well, I w all I was going to say is that the pro the big problem that I have with challenge rating is that it makes the assumption that you have a party of four optimized characters. Problem yeah. with that is that's one hell of an assumption. Yep. Ah, I agree. Uh, there's not a whole lot I can say about that other than, you know, four to six is a common party, and optimized character is super relative, depending on um, what you're dealing with. I mean, optimized to sneak into a castle is not the same as optimized to sneak attack if we're talking about a rogue. Mm -hmm. But... And be, and beyond that, beyond that, um, given given some of the problems you've had, I'm guessing that you're not that you're not a fan of the Vancian model when it comes to spells. Vancian is that spell slots? Yeah the the reason it's called Vancian is because of it because of the concept coming from the fact that Gygax and Arneson were big fans of the Dying Earth series of books by Jack Vance. Ah, no, I, I just hadn't heard the term. No, um, I am not a huge fan. I understand it from a balance standpoint. It absolutely makes it easier to balance. But we didn't do that, um, mostly because, to me, it seems like a shortcut and not how magic should work. We actually use two different forms of casting. Uh, the first one is what you would think is a classic wizard. uses mana-based. You gain mana every level. You know, Use it how you want on each spell. Um, which allows us to allow a, a lot more creativity in how you cast spells. Do I want to throw meta magic, you know, the meta magic equivalent or things like that? Um, but it'll cost more mana. Mm -hmm. The other option is channeling, um, which honestly we're very proud of because it represents a lot of fiction very well. Um, channeling is you gather the energy, then you cast the spell. Mm -hmm. Now you can do this all day, but it's slower than magic inherently. Which I can get that. And one of the, that brings me to something else I want I wanted to cover, and that is class design because it, based on what I'm seeing, it looks like instead of instead of multi-classing being something that the game is fighting you about, um, you're ta you're taking a far more. You almost don't have a choice but to the multi-class. Um, well, what, what I was saying I is that it's built, it's built in right out of the gate. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you almost don't have a choice but to multi-class. Um, I'm not sure how you would play a game using your system without picking at least two classes. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the way we, we do that is there's six tiers of classes. Tier zero is how to be an adventurer. And tier five is let me 1v1 God. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you know, you have tier two, which is, you know, a veteran. He, he is very experienced. And tier three, which is the palace guard. And tier four, which is the king's personal champion. And, you know. Um, well, let's, be, be, let's, put it in, let's put it into context a little bit. Um, I'd like to go. You said it's tiers zero through five. Yes. I'd li- I'd like to I'd like to do a bit of um character association. I'll go through okay. I'll go through each tier and I want you to name a character from any kind of media. Ooh, as, okay. And it does doesn't matter doesn't matter what. And just to use just as a example of someone at that tier. Um Okay. So yeah. tier zero we'll start with. Tier zero is a generic peasant. It, it's not a main character yet. So that that's that was the hardest one to pick. <laughs> um, well, pro- I'd say it's pro- I'd say it's probably akin to Dark Souls players who play who play the who play the um, naked cl- na- the equivalent of naked in in their class at at the start. Yeah, um, that that would. Yeah, I don't play any of the Souls games, so I didn't even think of that. But yeah. All right. Um. Next, next would be tier one. Tier one, uh, very, very, very young Naruto. Um, you know, right after he learned Shadow Clone, he knows a thing or two, but he still hasn't learned how to master it, and he still has to learn how to do all this. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't have any game stopping abilities. It's very much like I'm kind of a, a shinobi. I exist. I know a thing or two. All right. Um. Tier two. Honestly, I'd kind of like to pick up a historical figure for that one. Um, I'd love to say uh, Robin Hood. He's better than the vast majority of trained soldiers, but he's not just an unstoppable force. Mm -hmm. Tier three. So, uh, tier three, hmm. there's a couple good ones that come to mind. Um, and if, if you can't tell, I, I'm fairly, I watch a, a more anime than I watch normal shows, but for this one, I'd pick the Witcher. He is functionally unstoppable to normal, you know, Geralt, uh, of Rivia. He's functionally unstoppable to normal people and is a threat to most everyone he fights. Though there are people who's completely out of his weight class, like the elder vampire, you know, mm-hmm. um, so Witcher. Right. Tier four. Hmm. Again, I'm trying not to pick two obscure characters, so I apologize if I'm kind of delaying. Um, hmm. Naruto. Again, I kind of hitting back to him, but um, or actually. Do you is Sword Art Online a super popular anime? Does that count as one? Um, you don't have to worry about popularity when it comes to me because I'm the kind of person who dig who digs deep into in into the trenches. Yeah. Um, I'd almost say Kirito, but that's almost a deceptive thing. The reason I pick him is because where other people have to do it in groups, but they do it effortlessly. He does it by himself effortlessly, effortlessly. So to me, he's doing four or five man's work by himself at a very high level without struggling. Mm-hmm. And tier five. I'm going to go with Raceland from a uh, Dragonlance. Mm-hmm. R- Raceland is fully capable of overthrowing the gods and is a absolutely top tier mage. Now, with the, with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to the way you have um, classes, I'm guessing I'm guessing it's a bit more freeform than the than the level based approach. Oh, absolutely! It is completely freeform. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you start at tier zero as a warrior, you could be a, a farmer learning how to use a sling. I mean, it could be anything. Um, but when you hit tier one, you can now pick anything else. You can go be an assassin. You can go be a duelist. Uh, uh, anything. I mean, I'm. We have eighty-one classes. Pick the next one you choose. You can go be a mage. You can go be a, a channeler. You can go anything. 
And that's true at any point. Yeah. Um, you don't actually have to finish a class. Each tier of class has 10 levels. At any point in that growth, you can have a near-death experience and find God and become a channeler of divinity. Um, no, and that's true no matter which way you look at it. Mm-hmm. Now, there, at higher levels, there are requirements for classes. Um, you, you don't get to be an archmage without at least knowing a few schools of magic and having X amount of mana. Mm-hmm. You know, like you, you have to know a thing or two. Yeah. Now, with the with that in mind, I also I also saw that um the, that the t- the levels within the, the levels within them grant grant f- can grant features can grant ta- can grant talents along with along with other bonuses what i'm what i'm really cu- what i'm really curious about is how it ha- is how it would handle is how um talents are handled because i've had a i've had a mix first off i'm guessing talents are the equiv- are the rough equivalent to feats Super rough equivalent, but yeah. Second, secondly, um, a bit of when I look at the when I look at the way feats happened in third edition slash Pathfinder and in fifth edition, they're two ends of an extreme. Um, the fifth edition version of feats is, aside from the aside from the fact that it was a case of missing the point, in my opinion, it's also because of, because of how few you end up getting. Um, and the fact that you have to trade ability score improvement in order to get in order to get it, the fe- the feat ends up ends up having more drawbacks than than it's worth because Five E is afraid of customization. On the other hand, you have the you have the way um, feats worked in in Third Edition and Pathfinder where you ha- where you you had way too many traps. It was almost a, it was almost a minefield. And had to plan out well in advance in order to get certain feats. The yeah. whipping boy that I have with this kind of thing is um, whirl is whirlwind attack. Yeah, there you'll get to have spring attack and mobility and shit, dude. I only get seven feats, you know. Absolutely. And I know some may argue, but you'll be able to get that in a few levels just by just by being a fighter. That's not the which I always say. That's not the point. The point is you have to. Pl- you have to plan so far in advance and it becomes a false choice conundrum. So that is absolutely not true here. The way our talents work, uh, one, as you've noticed, there's no option. You gain a talent, you gain a talent. You know, it's not, oh, do I do this or do I do this? It's have a talent. Mm-hmm. Um, in addition, our talents, when you, if you're, you're, you have a talent pool in every class. When you have a talent, pick a talent from that talent pool. Mm-hmm. There is uh, only... Two examples that I can think of off the top of my head. Three. There's three. Uh, that you have to have a requirement for. Um, and it's one of those requirements that if you don't have it, I don't know how you got there. For example, uh, warriors get weapon proficiency, weapon focus, weapon superiority, and weapon mastery. The way that works is weapon proficiency means, means you use it. Weapon focus, which pretty much everyone can get without any real difficulty, uh, means you use it well. You're actually trained. It's not just, I know which sword side to hold. It's, I kind of put the point in the other guy. Then you, at that point, you branch into weapon mastery or weapon superiority. You can pick both, neither. But you have to know which side of the horde to, or to hold. Um, so one thing you'll notice is most of these guys get four talents. And you'll get weapon focus for free. So technically, there is a requirement there. But it's one of those requirements that's so bare bones, so minimal that it's I don't consider that a trap. Mm-hmm. Um, and the good thing about most of our talents, probably 80, 85 percent of our talents is they almost all give you additional actions or additional cool things. Very rarely. And, and the ones I just mentioned are one of the few. Do we just go, oh, have a bonus to hit, have a bonus to damage, have a bonus to health? Um, most of our talents are, uh, after a successful attack, make a free five foot, five foot movement. Mm-hmm. Um, that'll be the mobile, you know, weapon style or, uh, I think no combat style. Sorry. 
Um, you know, there's command. Now, there are tiers to these. So, for example, if you're tier one, you'll have access to the tier one commands. You cannot pick a tier two or tier three command. But if you're, you just happen to take captain, which is a tier three class, you don't have any of the other command, you can still pick a tier three command because your class allows it. Mm-hmm. Does that kind of make sense in how we avoided that particular minefield? Yeah. The key th- the key thing that I've that I've always held is is having requ- having requirements is is not the problem. It's when the it's when those requirements get excessive that yeah. is the that is the problem. Oh. M- most of our talent requirements boil down to pick a class that can learn it, mm-hmm. um, which you know I to me that's not excessive. M- almost all. No, that's not a, that's that's no that's nowhere near excessive. That's the, that is plus in plus in doing that you give pe- you give people a baseline. It's not like say like say the feature where you have where you have you have um it's just okay pick okay pick pick from pick from this wide 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 ass list every every other level or um or certain approaches where you have a you have a um you have a wide menu to pick from, but yeah. there's not a whole lot of um, guidance. It, well, warriors can't learn how to gain more mana. They don't have any mana. They can't learn how to gain any. Mm-hmm. But boy, can they learn how to hit you better with a sword. Yeah. And I, I keep saying sword. Obviously, there's other weapons. It's just, you know, kind of the default in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and inverse. Mages can learn how to get more schools of magic and mana, but they don't really deal with weapons very much. They're much more likely to throw you away with wind rather than, you know, mm. bother. Yeah, and with the speaking of, speaking of combat, um, I had noticed that you guys are going by an action point system. Mm-hmm. What pro- what prompted that? What prompted that particular direction? Primarily summoning an action economy. So one of the reasons we're a D100 rollover system is to allow the customization we want, numbers have to get bigger. Um, you end up having to, if we used a D20 system, you really can't have more than a plus 12, plus 13, plus 15, um, which means that if you're going to be a level 60, like it's very easy to do in our class. If you go in a straight line, tier 0 to tier 5, max it out, that's tier 60, that's a normal cam- level 60, that's a normal campaign. Um, you know, okay, well, I got a plus 12 or plus 15, what am I really supposed to be doing here? So as we started increasing the numbers, we realized that you needed more actions. It mattered that your, that your super awesome warrior who can cut through a mountain got more attacks than the, the peasant who picked up a sword yesterday. You know? Mm-hmm. And in the in the same vein of that, I'd like to I'd like to ask about one other thing in particular that has had a reputation of get of getting shafted or ha- or having pay to not suck problems. Let's talk about dual okay. wielding. Oh, absolutely. Uh, sorry, that's one of my babies. So I have a lot of martial arts experience on a personal level. Mm-hmm. Um, so this weapon styles, combat styles. Um, warriors end up getting a lot more talents, partially, I won't say because they need them, but most of the cool weapon things that you can do with weapons are talents, um, as well as commands. So, the way dual wielding works in our system is, it's dual wield melee or dual wield ranged. Um, you know, if you want to dual wield like crossbows or two throwing knives or whatever, dual wield ranged. The way it works is this, um, at the basic weapon style, your first attack action, you get a free extra attack. So it counts as two. Um, now, on the greater weapon style, each time you take it, the next action attack is another attack. We also have things like Furious Assault, where every attack at every attack doubles your amount. So if you're dual wielding with Furious Assault... You could be rolling 30 attacks at, you know, the super high, you know, God is cowering from you level. I mean, it does take that level, but you know, I think 28 
is if you're really playing weird games with talents and really min-maxing, you can get up to 28 attacks. Mm-hmm. Now... Uh, and that does require dual wielding. That does require... Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to... When it comes to... When it comes to... Mo- now, obviously, I I portray myself as the gaming monk, so you can figure out what sort of archetype I tend to play quite a bit. Um, and in a lot of get in a lot of games, the monk are the monk archetype or the monk class is def is definitely your is definitely your stand-in for unarmed martial artist, which I'm perfectly fine with. But there's one problem that I often have, and that is games treating ma- treating martial arts styles as this one size fits all approach, or not making different styles. I'm so glad you brought that up. Oh. So monk is actually one of my favorite things that we've done in our system. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is considered the channeler of essence. Um, they, it sounds dumb, but hear me out. It's essentially the Naruto. Believe it. I can punch through a wall. I believe so much in myself that I'm tapping into magic and I can now punch through a stone wall. They are very self buffing. They buff their speed. They can buff all of these things through channeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they can concentrate to maintain it. Now, when you do that, you lose your actions. So it is, you know, the monks have a balancing point of, I want to be better, but I want to be able to move. You know, Mm -hmm. I want to be able to attack them. I am impervious to pain. Well, yes, but you're spending your entire action holding on to that. Um, However, monks are not barehanded. Not by default. Um, They have essentially two paths, way of the fist and way of the weapon. Way of the Fist, they get more channeling and more ability to maintain things. Where Way of the Weapon, you know, while they're not wielding a weapon, Way of the Weapon, they can just, uh, everything they normally do works with their weapon. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to be unarmed, there is an unarmed weapon style. It's not, I won't say it's not very good, um, but when you're fighting people with swords, punching them is a really hard sale. Um, so the way it works is it's the exact same as dual wielding, unarmed weapon. Unarmed weapon style, we have grappling, there's tripping, there's pinning, there's assisted grappling, there's there's options here. But instead of going, we're going to teach you judo or karate, or we just go, here's your combat maneuvers, here's your weapon style. Make it make sense for you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the... I think something that something that I always, always, tr- always try and um, at least at least enforce with people is to think is to think about why their char- their character is using the fighting style that they are. Uh, okay. And just an example that an example they often get they often give some of my students is to consider the um, fighting styles when it came to lightsaber combat in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, form one was the super basic. It does everything, but nothing well. Form two was defensive. Form two, form two was is the duelist style. Oh, I'm sorry. Form three is defensive. Mm-hmm. That's Obi Wan. Yeah, form three, form three was all, was all about defense. Um, form four was the was the acrobat. Um, yeah. Form five is an evolution of form three. That's more about aggressive defense. Um, form six was super aggressive, and then form seven was Joyo, which s- evolved six, into Vapad. Six is the six is Nemon, and that was kind of the jack of that was essentially a this hybrid jack of all trades. It was made more for di- more for diplomats than it was for fighters. The idea okay. of hybridizing force use with lightsaber combat, and seven is more is more about weaponizing aggre- weaponizing either yours aggression. or the aggression. Okay. So again, I, I really do appreciate the recap. It's been a long time since I've looked into it, mostly because yeah. I have issues with the forms and alien bodies, and you know, I was like, "How do y'all have seven? Never mind. Never mind. It's not important. You know, just hand wave it." But what was your question about that? Um, it's more, more about more about using the using the using the using the combination 
of of ta- of talents and cl- and class abilities would it would it be feasible for someone to to replicate to replicate um partic- particular f- fighting styles not one to one but some but something approximate to them so that um two people using a sword could play could play differently yes is the absolute answer so again we have combat styles we have weapon styles we have um shoot we have various weapon abilities and things of that nature so for example if you wanted to play a chinese spearman you would pick two-handed weapon great weapon um and a flowing style okay so you're not going to sit there and hammer them with a great sword you're gonna but with the exact same talents exact same talents but instead of combat style flowing you pick combat style aggressive or combat style you know defensive where you get more guard um you can now play a german landschnecht mm-hmm. you know this hyper aggressive and functionally you have the exact same character you've switched two talents and have a little bit different equipment mm-hmm. now how where are you where are you trying to aim for on the lethality end of things so that is is one of our favorite things about this tier system. You can stop at any point. You know, you can be like, no, my game doesn't go past tier two or tier three or whatever. You know, it's Age of Conan. You get tier one. No one knows how to fight yet. Um, but um, as a rule of thumb, lethality is low. Um, so it's not unreasonable for a fighter, max level fighter, getting four thousand um, things and being fairly and very evasive and very tanky and arm damage reduction and really hard to kill he might deal 300 400 damage a pop but you know um he 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 can soak that 10 times um however mild counterpoint the assassin when completely maxed out and with everything in his favor which is going to be difficult um he has to spend an entire turn studying his opponent and things of that nature can deal like a completely ignorant amount of damage i mean like 8000 to 10000 damage Mm-hmm. It's essentially he's shooting out your heart. So I, I hesitate to be like lethality is entirely on you, but it kind of is. The DM can absolutely set the tone and go, most people are using you know plus ten damage and it takes you know hundreds of hits to kill you, or you guys are on parity so it takes ten hits to hit you, or you piss me off. I'm sending an assassin after you. Good luck. Hope you die. Mm-hmm. Does that? Kind of, yeah, I'd I'd say so. Now, you touched on magic earlier, and I want I want to come back to I want to come back to that. Would it be fair of me, based on based on what you've said, to say that magic is not necessarily fire and forget? So magic in our system, not that there's not damaging spells, but magic automatically hits. Um. You use mana, it hits. Um, now, the again, I really hesitate to be like the most effective, but there's a lot of control spells that target different attributes. There's no such thing as a dumb stat in our system, mm-hmm. um, at least in part due to you know a intelligent wizard will rotate through your saves until he finds the oh you're weak to willpower. Let me use this void ability to you know. Um. So, but they do automatically hit, and so I, fire and forget is such a weird thing. Wizards do the most. They have the most abilities. There's, got 350 spells in our book. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not all of them are combat-oriented. There's, you know... You know, the I'm not to use channelers right now. There's absolutely teleportation and runes and being able to make people friendlier to you and all of these things. But, you know, mages end up slightly on a on a lower end because they can do everything. They end up not they don't they're not alpha strike. Um, the assassin will always deal more damage than them. Um, and while you can absolutely make an arcane warrior and, and really mess people up, you know, use a sword and, and, and magic. Um, you'll never have the health of a warrior, but they do everything well. 
Mm -hmm. So, so we're not so. So we're not going to have a whole lot of instances of Nova-ing, especially, especially by mages. I, I am certain that someone who spent enough time with the book could end up making a class or a high enough level or something bizarre that they could find a way to Nova. But in all of our playtests, and we're probably up to 70 to 100 hours, it, it's hard to count, you know, Probably 90. Call it 90 hours of active playtesting and not just talking around. Um, no one has yet found a way to Nova. Yeah. Now, you can absolutely encase their feet in stone and shoot arrow after arrow after arrow, you know, mana bolt, mana bolt, mana bolt, and <laughs> kill them. But one shots with a mage, especially if they have a level parity, is... I mean, there is a death save, you know, save or suck. But it's, you know, I, there's not a huge amount of noting, as you're asking. Yeah. Uh, I mostly I mostly ask that kind of thing because there's been there's been there's been some bad habits by some by some games where mages end up getting way too much attention. And as one of my dear friends put it, they get more game out of the game. No, absolutely not. Uh, again, for a multitude of reasons. One, we have channelers, which are absolutely fighting them for coolest mage space. You know, because out of our channelers, you have essentially the druids, the clerics, and the monks. Um, and all three of those play very differently and have different uh, pros and cons. They tend to be narrower than the mage. Um, for example, the monk pretty exclusively only works on himself. He really can't help other people. Um, he just does that better than a mage will. And he can do it all day. Um, but, again, this is something we worked very hard on. Our warriors are absolutely every bit into the game as anyone else. Between the command talents, which I don't know if you've had a chance to look at, but they actually give free movement, bonuses to attack, bonuses to willpower saves, bonus to... You know, I spend my action point and everyone within 150 feet of me gets a free 10-foot movement? Mm -hmm. Ooh. You know, that, in my opinion, that's pretty good. Um, you know, and they also have all the stuff we've talked about with combat maneuvers where I can make you bleed out, I can trip you, I can grapple you, I can, you know. I... So while the mage is a much better controller than the warrior, don't mistake what I'm saying, there's no such thing as a dumb stat. Yeah, and I, and because everyone can be a mage, I, I mean, I can't. I think an all mage party would be a little bizarre, but it's very possible, um, and have distinct, you know, ten mages. You can be completely distinct each ten. So no, mages are not over focused in our system. Sorry. Well, I have a bad habit to ramble on. If I do, just you know, cut me off. No worries, man. Well. In this, in in a bit of a side, in a bit of a side to that, one thing I'm curious about is is um gishes. If you're familiar with the term, uh, I don't sure. I heard you correctly. I heard gishes. Yeah, gishes. G I S H. I'm um, not. Unless it's the monster from one of the hells in D and D. No. Um, okay. Gish, a gish comes from. Um, get Zerai, because they, and it's basically the basically someone who's comp, who's relatively competent in both fit in both, um, fight in both fighting and casting. Um, mm -hmm. Some they they can run the gamut between being only useful in specific circumstances or being over useful, like the O D and D elf. Um, actually, not O D and D, A D and D. What am I saying? Yeah, I but, understand what you're saying. The The coolest thing about our... We have three. Tier 1, 3, and 5. Mm -hmm. You have the Arcane Warrior, the Sorcerer Soldier, and the Eldritch Knight. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially the way they work is you have to have at least a little bit of Warrior or a little bit of Mage to roll into that. And you don't get all the cool shit that the relative... Class. The thing you'll notice going through our classes is warriors 
pretty much get bonus to hit, bonus damage, and mages pretty much get extra spells, extra temperatures. I can use more each time. The arcane war, you know, the the bows don't get to do that. They they don't get all the cool shit for being a specialist class. But what they do get is they get the ability to go. My damage reduction is now doubled. I don't have to wait for the mage to cast it on me. Mm-hmm. My weapon now hits harder. You know. So, again, because of our customizability, how you make that Geish geesh character determines, is it only super useful in one or two situations? I'm an air mage, so I teleport around and hit people from behind. Well, cool. You know, if that works for you. Um, I'm a battle mage. Well, you're really just a warrior then with extra steps, you know. Or you're a classic mage. I'm a fire mage or, or you know, what water mage or any of that. Well, how you ran your character, you know, and, and kind of how you picked your spells and what you're doing and, and how you use them determines how useful you are. Mm-hmm. Now, let's... I, I've, I've kind of danced around it a bit, but let's go into the core mechanic. Because, as I mentioned before, you're using... as unless I'm mistaken, a roll-high D100 system. Oh. Yep, roll-over. So, sorry, the reason I, I did want to mention the roll-high thing instead of roll-over mm-hmm. is uh, you will absolutely have roll-over 150. You know? So it's not just, I rolled a 99, that's great. It's roll-over whatever the target number is for that problem. Yeah, that's... Whenever I say roll high, it's always you're trying to roll over a target number instead of rolling under it. Your to- your total. Score. Oh, okay. Um, but what? But for what? Which, to be fair, is certainly in the minority when it comes to D100 setups. A lot of people use D100 as percentile die. But yep. what I'm curious about is is what is, is what is your extra oomph um, sort of effect. Um, Rollmaster had the Rollmaster and subsequently stuff like Against the Dark Master, Harp, and Anima have the open roll, where you where you explode the roll on a on a ninety one or higher. Um, might vary between games, but that's what say Anima uses, and the min, the minimum sure. goes up by one with every explosion. Um, how do, how do you ha- how do you have it set up? Because obviously you can't do you can't do cr- you can't do criticals. You can't do natural one hundred as your critical because that's a bit that's a bit too low of odds. Yeah. Um. So the way we do it is, I think I actually touched on this earlier. Um. Any multiple of ten, so ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, six, seventy, eighty, ninety, one hundred. Uh. Roll again. Add the two together. As long as you roll a multiple of ten, you keep rolling. Mm-hmm. Um, which made me feel awful for one of our playtesters. Actually, they rolled a ten and then a two, and it was like, "Oh, I exploded!" Uh, natural twelve, you know. Um, the dice gods. So that's how we do they that. Take it away. They pretty much just took from her. I felt awful. <laughs> um, but with that being said, uh, we also do have critical. So we have both exploding and critical. Critical in our system is if you get 50 over the target number, whether or not that's a skill or a combat, extra things happen. Mm-hmm. So. so, for example, if you needed to roll a 50, because super easy, and you, you know, 50 on the lockpick, or, or, you know, um, and you roll 150, you get a lot of extra stuff from that, ranging from. Yo, know, you realize there's guards around. You know, you're, you're supposed to get extra information when you succeed by that amount. Yeah, and mostly extra information, though. If it's a specific skill, you can also get bonuses to attack. For example, if you're writing, um, you know, and this was as my DM. You know, it's not in the rules. Um, I gave a plus 10 because she got a plus 50 over her ride skill because of her horse, plus 10 to hit on her next attack. Yeah. Now, when it comes to damage, are you guys implementing a wound system along with HP, or is it just strictly HP? It's pretty strictly HP. Because of the way the game is set up and how they, 
you know, how easy it is to be both fatal and non-fatal, it's not too hard to, uh, for the DM to adjust the fatality level without going, oh, you took 25% of your health, take a death save. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's cer- that's certainly fair because nobody nobody wants a save or die moment. Now, yeah. I know you mentioned spells automatically hit, but what me- what methods would there potentially be to mi- to mitigate? Um, th- Honestly, mitigate, I'll, I'll, mitigate I'll, the spell. Most of the way you mitigate spells is by making your save. Um, so. 95% of spells, and again, I'm pulling that percentage completely out, um, but you know, the vast majority of spells have a save. So you may take 2d10 damage, um, which, as we've kind of mentioned, that's not a massive amount of damage. And if you fail, they'll get a bonus thing for that. Um, so you make your save, is, is the short answer. Yeah. And I'm get. I'm guessing that you have that. There's going to be a means to calculate um, what the what the save is based on the based on the um, spell and the character. Uh, it's not a calculation. We tell you point blank that oh, this spell has a target number seventy. Oh, you put this uh, spell temperance on there. Now it's a target number ninety because you got a plus twenty. Ah. But it has almost nothing to do with the um, level of the character as far as normal target numbers go. Obviously, again, there's uh, fringe cases like counterspelling where the caster level matters, but again. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, when it, comes to, when it comes to monsters, you plan on having a bestiary, and subsequently, are you planning on having a monster creation system for GMs? So, monster creation system is actually in the core book. Uh, it's chapter ten, template monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, in addition, you know, as uh, you know, we have thirty-one monsters, possibly thirty-four, um, in the core rule book. Mm-hmm. Um, we do intend to have a tome of existence, and we're actually—I'll go ahead and kind of leak this right now. We're very excited for it. Because what we're going to do is we're going to have essentially peasant monsters that you then can add your own template to. So if you want, you know, a dragon mage, you pick the dragon and you, you know, you want a orc palace guard, you know, you want an orc, you know, an elf chief, you know, and you will be able to pretty much easily make NPCs that make sense, you know, and flesh out um, who they're fighting very easily. And speaking, it's pretty. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. Speaking of, um, I've seen a lot of cases where ra- where um race is present, but it doesn't seem to matter all that much, especially once you get into higher levels. How how much of a factor does how what how much impact does race have when it comes to character creation in your system? <sighs> That's a hell of a question. So the short is is that it does matter. Um, for example, our elf race is winged elves. They can all fly. Now at tier four, multiple you know both mages and nature get the ability to make anyone fly. You know, and before that, if you're an air mage, you can fly anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but they just that that's your race. You, you can fly. You're an elf that has wings. You can fly. Go team. Mm-hmm. Um, humans get a stat bonus. Um, minotaurs end up, you know, it matters. How much it matters really depends on your DM and the problems you're having to face. Uh, and I do want to mention something as far as the winged elves go. The spells are better. Um, so the winged elves get tired when they use it. The casting version of that does not. Mm-hmm. Um, our fatigue system is actually kind of brutal. Um, it's how we do uh, uh, non-lethal damage as well. All right. A lot. Of, a lot of games have what I've nicknamed an extra effort system. Um, in Eclipse Phase, it's Moxie, and Shadowrun, it's Edge. In D and D Fourth Edition, they had action points. Five um, E, 
is supposed to have it in the form of inspiration, but it's severely undercooked, in my opinion. Um, fate has, well, fate points. Do you guys have something similar to this? Actually, we don't. Um, we had discussed it in the kind of the beginning when we were still fleshing everything out. And uh, we made the design. Design. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Oh, uh, uh, in the beginning, we made the design design decision to not include anything of that nature. Which is cer is certainly fair. I'm not saying that every game d has to have it. Um, no, but a, a huge do. majority does have it. Mm -hmm. um, another thing you'll notice is um, resurrection is incredibly difficult in our system. If you do die, coming back is hard. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, when we made that decision, we decided that there's so many efforts and so many options before you hit death. And honestly, there's so much you have to track as a player... How many action points do I have? How much health do I have? How much damage reduction do I have? How much movement do I have? How much? We were just like, no, there's not an extra fluff here. You're already the main character. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No fate points, no edge. Which is is certainly fair. Um. Uh, we're still kind of the verdicts out on whether or not that's a popular thing. None of our play testers have brought it up. But again, we're definitely looking forward to people's reviews of the game to see if what they think. From if it's noticeable, from my honestly. perspective, I'd say st I'd say stay the course with not having it now. If you guys end up doing a advanced version of the core book down the road, then maybe consider it. It is possible. Again, and time will tell. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do want to offer my congr my congratulations on on the fact that you got you guys managed to get past your initial goal. In fact, at the time of this recording, it's at fifty seven hundred. When you were only asking yep. for five thousand, when you've got twenty five days to go, um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking um, this sometime this time next year? Oh, absolutely not. No, we're looking at six or seven months. Um, so as of right now, the book printing companies are horrifically backed up. Um, just, I, I don't actually know why, but they are, they're saying 14 to 16 weeks to print. Mm -hmm. However, once the Kickstarter is finalized and we can move forward and pay for art and, and that's really the, what we're waiting on. Um, like I said, we've started showing sneak peeks of the art we have, but um, honestly, the Kickstarter funding will really determine how much beautiful art we can put into the book. Um, once that's done, we get the art and we give it to the book printing company and we start shipping it out. Um, honestly, we are, we tell pe people we're going to give it to them in January. That is a honest answer. Um, but what I'm pushing for on my end is I would love to get it in people's hands before Christmas. Maybe not much before Christmas. We may maybe a Christmas Eve miracle kind of thing, but love to get it to them in Christmas. Mm -hmm. So definitely not a year. Uh, I'd really look for it in six to seven months. Yeah. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it de how it develops. I do think that there's a, a fair bit of potential with with the way it is currently. Um, but with that said. I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> and I said, if you would have known I had to bring booze, I would have, you know, made sure to do it. But <laughs> And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around Absolutely. here, drinking is, drinking is, not, is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time, and uh, 
Well, that, I look forward to talking with you again. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to talk to you in about two weeks when we're a little bit closer to the ending of our Kickstarter and possibly be able to give out a few more details of upcoming projects mm-hmm. and um, updated expectations. Yeah, we can, I'm pretty sure we can work we can work something out. It may not be able to be two weeks to the day, but we, but well, no. but that's yeah. something we can that's something we can hash out in the ro- down the road. Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!